Hello, my name is Adil Barucha. I'm a gastroenterologist at Mayo Clinic, and together with my colleagues, Dr. Richard Locke and Dr. John Pemberton, I'd like to encourage you to review the American Gastroenterological Association AGA Technical Review on Constipation, which will be published in the January 2013 issue of Gastroenterology. This is a comprehensive update of the previous technical review, which was published 13 years ago and is intended to provide a one-stop reference on constipation for the practicing gastroenterologist. While many physicians regard constipation to be synonymous with reduced stool frequency, patients refer to a variety of symptoms such as straining to defecate, hard stools, and the inability to defecate as will, or lack of complete satisfaction after defecation as constipation. The symptom is very common, perhaps approximately 15% of all adults and over 30% of elderly people have constipation. However, only a minority seek medical care, but this still accounts for approximately 8 million annual physician visits in the United States. Most people see a primary care provider and are prescribed laxatives. The role of a gastroenterologist is to assist in identifying selected patients who might benefit from additional therapy or more specific treatments. And I'm going to share a simple five-step plan to accomplish this. The first step, as you all recognize, is a careful clinical assessment to elicit the specific symptoms, clarify which symptoms are distressing, and inquire about medications such as opiates that can cause constipation. I always use the Bristol stool form scale and will often ask patients to complete a two to four week bowel diary before they see me because these are efficient and reliable methods to characterize bowel habits. And don't forget a meticulous digital rectal exam which can often suggest or exclude a defecatory disorder. Step two includes the laboratory tests, and the only essential test here is a complete blood count. We often check a fasting serum glucose, sensitive TSH or calcium, but these tests are really not essential. Likewise, only selected patients, such as those who have alarm clinical features, medically refractory constipation, or patients who have not had an age-appropriate colon cancer screening procedure require uh, an endoscopy or imaging for colonic lesions. Step three is a trial of dietary fiber supplements and or over-the-counter osmotic or stimulant laxatives, which, as we now know from several rigorous control trials, work well for many patients. For patients who don't respond to these agents, step four is to perform a norectal test, which can identify a defecatory disorder. And this is important because defecatory disorders should be managed with biofeedback-aided pelvic floor retraining rather than laxatives. If anorectal tests don't disclose a defecatory disorder, then colonic transit should be assessed, allowing patients to be characterized as normal or slow transit constipation. Regardless, patients are generally can be managed with osmotic or stimulant laxatives, and for those patients that don't respond to these older agents, newer therapeutic options such as intestinal secretagogues, such as lubiprostone and linaclotide, which are approved in the United States, and procalopride, which is a serotonin 5-HD4 receptor agonist that is not approved in the United States, are available and work reasonably well. Finally, a small subset of patients with medically refractory slow transit constipation will require and benefit from a subtotal colectomy provided they don't have pelvic floor dysfunction or an upper gastrointestinal dysmotility. All this information and much more is in the review and the accompanying AGA medical position statement. I hope you enjoy reading it and thank you for listening.